started, we have, I think, 18 projects which are presenting. So we're going to be here for a little bit, buckle up, here we go. Okay, here's some judging criteria for you. Um, I'm missing one, but here's what we've got. Um, code written, so I think you've all submitted your projects to Cody. We're going to, I think we've got a little script. We're going to see how much effort you put in over the weekend. Uh, that one didn't work. That one didn't work. Right. Maybe we're not, all right, we're going to look at it though. We're going to maybe put some weight into how much effort you've been able to do in the last day or so, maybe question. All right, definitely project completeness. So when you're presenting it, like, is this a prototype? Is this something you can ship? Is it like ready to go? So that'll be kind of something we're weighing in. Uh, layer two-ness, how well did you incorporate the theme that we're operating off of, which is layer two stuff. Uh, wow factor, like how impressive is it? Is this like super cool? Is this something that you're like, wow, that's really cool or not? And then the fifth one that's not on here is like your orange pillness, like I guess how Bitcoin-y it is, et cetera. So I sort of think that's um, hopefully that was a, a, a given. Okay, any questions about judging criteria? Love to see it. All right, here's our prizes really fast. We got a grand prize of 2.5K and we'll give like two seats to a of any upcoming in-person Base 58 class. Um, second prize is gonna be 1.5K. Oh, my thing fell off the bottom. Um, and a one in-person Base 58 class. So any in-person Base 58 class that I'm doing anywhere in the world at any point, you say, hey, I wanna join, it'd be like, great. Come on, you're on the thing. And then this last one, I can't see, that's awesome. Uh, Fediment was one of our sponsors for the hackathon, so if you happen to build something on Fediment, we will give a 1,000 bonus prize. You can win both the grand prize and the Fedi prize. This is like an add-on or an independent thing. Great. Okay. Cool. Any questions about prizes? It's not stats, right? Um, they will be paid out in stats. That's right. On um, I don't know what the market price is, but we'll figure that out. Um, <laughs> Oh no, this is in dollars. This is in dollars. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> this is in USD. Okay, cool. Um, also, what I, I, what I can do is the next Bitcoin Plus Plus stuff at the end. Uh, we've got some judges. One of our judges is running a little bit late, um, so we'll see. But we have Mike from Brink who's here to judge. So it's Mike. Mike's going to be helping out. Bill uh, Steve Villarreal. Yeah. Dulce Villarreal, who runs Liberia de Satoshi, which does some of the best Bitcoin education in Espanol, um, is going to be on our panel as well. And then our third one, who is late, he used to be here uh, halfway through his period of Easter, is coming. Um, so he'll be judging as much as I am. And I think I'm going to sit on the panel too, so it'll be like four of us. You know, whatever. Okay, cool. Any questions? Let's get started. So, uh, how many of you guys have heard me talk about Replit before? Woo! Yeah, so like Replit's kind of the thing that I talk about almost as much as I talk about Bitcoin, right? And there's a couple of reasons why. Um, so in terms of, oh, we've got the lead maintainer for extensions over there. So extensions are something you can do where basically you can add a new pane into the Replit uh, thing over here, right? So like all of these are different extensions in there. And Connor, you can raise your hand. Yep, so he's the, one of the maintainers for Replit extensions. And so what's really cool about this is basically you just take a React component and you dump it in there and you can like have it be added onto your IDE. And so um, this needs to refresh. Once this refreshes and it doesn't time out, then what I did was I took one of the best Bitcoin helper tools out there called ScriptWiz and I put it in as an extension. And so now anybody, while you're developing within Replit, you can use ScriptWiz as part of the as part of the browser, right? And so this is kind of like the first step toward what a lot of the stuff that I want to do for this of like bringing in basically all of the useful React tools that we have for interacting with Bitcoin stuff. So all of those nice front ends that um, we've been talking about, like, hey, these are like the things that help people onboard to Bitcoin of getting these front ends really nicely. You can use Replit's Nix backend in order to load all the binaries and all that kind of stuff. And use React extensions through the uh, through here in order to um, interact with it through the front end. And I think that Replit can be like the best Bitcoin building experience ever, and because it uses Nix on the back end. So in order for me to start running Bitcoin from a fresh Repl, this is the entire install process. It recognizes that it doesn't have the binary already installed. And then it hot installs it from their 10 terabyte cache. So it's loading this out of memory, rebuilding it uh, locally, deterministically, and it runs independent of the operating system directly in the browser. I can install and run Bitcoin D from my phone, right? 
get rid of the web view. I'm running a mainnet node. That was a fresh install. There was no, nothing that I had to do in there. I could have run this from my phone. I do run this from the, my phone all the time in order to interact, like in order to connect back to and interact with my node from my house, right? Like I think that this could be huge for onboarding Bitcoin developers, right? And so like for ScriptWiz, this is just like one of those nice useful tools because when I'm doing Bitcoin stuff, like let's say I go to mempool, over here, which will hopefully load. Well, you guys have taken Nifty's transaction class, right? So like one of the issues is that the hash of the block enter, these stuff, stuff like this, you have to split this to like little Indian, right? All of you guys have done that. And it's kind of annoying. <laughs> so something fun you can do with script whiz is, this did not load. Sorry. Copy it. Copy it. No, I got it right here. So I can go here, dump the hex, and now I have it as hex, as bytes, as binary, as hex, little endian, bytes, little endian, bin, binary, little endian. That's the SHA-256, that's the SHA-256D, the hash 160 if you're trying to make it into a Bitcoin address and stuff like that. It's like a nice, easy tool for while I'm building and I'm doing other stuff over here, just quickly add it to the extension and that sort of stuff. So like, what's next for this one? Um, like Core Lightning's admin dashboard, that's from um, Umbral. Anything that's written in React, you can turn into an extension here. So while you're developing on the back end, you can use Core Lightning's front end as one of these extensions, right? So like all this sort of stuff. So I'll be talking about this later, hopefully. And like, I really think this could be like the place for onboarding new Bitcoin devs, right? So this would be like, if you guys want to do extensions, you want to just take any existing Bitcoin React app that you guys have and put it into the workspace of the like you can do that super easily right now. Connor, wave your head again. Lead maintainer, right? So like, go talk to him about how to make it uh, happen for you. Okay. Cool, thanks. Um, hi, I'm Elle. I'm an entry level coder who loves Bitcoin. And I work with Cody, Nifty, and Chris to learn how to look at funds in the channel in between nodes, and then add the amount of MSATs from one node and the shared amount of MSATs, and then print out a response with an integer. So, um, Thank you all for being so welcoming and helpful, and I learned a lot, and I made new friends, and I had a really great time, so um, really good. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's really it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you wrote just like a little. Yeah, sure. Um, so, oops, sorry, I just. Okay. So this is the um, code that I used, and then so this part like gets it from the funds, and then this part adds it together and um, returns it as an integer. Cool. Well, is this a core lightning plugin? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you hook up Python to Core Lightning? Uh, go to the top of your file. What's the import? This one? The oh, top one. Oh, uh, uh, from file in dot client import plugin. Nice. Got it. We got it. Hi, everybody. You first. Oh, I'm Super Testnet, and this is what's your name again? Nico. Nico. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so we've been working. Uh, I, I'm a co-founder of a company called Wrigley. We do um, an on-chain hash rate futures market kind of situation. Uh, and we were talking yesterday with uh, Testnet, or sorry, Super. Um, and he had a really cool idea for how we could do this without an intermediary, so that's what we tried to hack together today. We're calling it P2BO, which is pay to boil the oceans. Uh, <laughs> so really quick, miners have a bunch of different types of risks that we have to deal with. Uh, if we can basically try and smooth out some of the volatility with respect to hash rate, that's really useful for miners. And every big miner in the world, we've talked with a lot of big pub codes that are miners, 
uh, they all want to try and find a way in which they can hedge on that hash rate risk, right? So here, really quickly, you can see, for example, anytime you have hash rate goes down, it's usually because machines are coming offline. When hash rate goes down, hash price goes up, which is good, but if you're one of these miners that have to unplug your machines, all of a sudden you have a bunch of downtime that you're not making any revenue from. So when you know hash rate rips and then hash price comes down, or and then a hash rate comes down, you want to be able to try and at least take out some kind of position where you can smooth out that volatility, right? Uh, likewise, in the kind of all business scenario, uh, when hash rate is ripping, you want to be able to say, oh, well, it's probably going to have to correct down after that. So let me take out uh, like a position to cover against that like side leak. You also have difficulty adjustments. So every time you have kind of, you're, you're getting closer and closer to a difficulty adjustment, you want to be able to say, okay, uh, I'm going to take one side or the other of what's going to happen for the next epoch that's coming up. The closer you get to that difficulty adjustment, the more confidence you're going to have on what the adjustment is going to be. Uh, so that's another place where you can try and take a position there to smooth out the curve. I'll hand it over to the super. Just one thing I thought was a good way to visualize this. Uh, you, you can kind of see that this is a pretty volatile chart, the, the, the difficulty adjustment over time. And that also reflects a miner's revenue. Like their revenues go up and down wildly. Uh, so what they would like to do, they would like to smooth in that chart. They would like it to be a smoother line so that they, ideally they want it to be flat. They want to always know exactly what their income is going to be. And so by giving them an option to uh, bet against, uh, to hedge their, their hedge what the hash rate is going to be in the future, uh, take a bet and say, I think the hash rate is going to go down, and if I, if I win, uh, I get money, and if I lose, you get money, that actually helps flatten that curve and take it from, from something like this to something like this. That makes sense? Okay, cool. So we're gonna do a bet here. We're gonna do a bet on Bitcoin. Uh, and two of, one of the cool things about Bitcoin is it's got script. And when you do a script, you get time locks. So you can put money in a time lock, time lock Bitcoin address where you have to wait before you can withdraw it. And we have two types of time locks. We have timestamp based time locks that are used the Unix timestamp, the number of seconds since a long time ago. Uh, and we have block time based time locks. So what we can do is we can create two spend paths. Uh, if two weeks pass by, I get to withdraw. But if two th 2016 blocks get mined before two weeks pass by, he gets to withdraw. All from the same Bitcoin address, with no need for a third party, and no need for any kind of uh, two or three multi-sig escrow stuff or anything like that. Just a simple Bitcoin address where I get to withdraw or he gets to withdraw, depending on whether blocks got mined quickly or not. Sound cool? We're gonna demo it. If you want to, you can follow along by just visiting this really cool website where you can do this. So I'm going to paste it in here. Here is a little website, and uh, this is only working on my reg test right now. But tomorrow we're going to put it on, or tomorrow I'm going to try to put it on testnet and signet and mainnet. But we're going to bet five thousand sats. Uh, what do you think? You want to go long or short? Um, I'll go short because. Down. You're gonna go long because long is the only one that works right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to accept his offer because I want to go short. <laughs> so all we gotta do is send 5,000 sats to this address. Normally I'd be doing this on mainnet where we can detect that automatically, but here it's on my local test environment, so I've gotta actually like type in the stuff. Uh, send to address. I know you probably can't see what I'm doing here. I'm sending 5,000 sats to that address. But I just did that and plug in the TX ID of the transaction. Now it wants something called a V out, which is um, which is this thing Bitcoin has. Get transaction. And in this case, it was one. The V out is one. I put that in there. Like I said, normally that would be detected automatically, but here it's local environment. It doesn't know what's going on, so. We do that and we get two transactions out of this. This one uh, will send the money to me uh, if I win, if the 2016 blocks happens. And then the next one I'll show you on the next page will send it to him. But let's just try and see what happens if I broadcast this. Uh, send raw transaction. Yeah, you see that red text down there at the bottom? It says it failed. BIP 768 non final. Or, yeah. That means uh, you can't do it because 2016 blocks haven't been mined. Uh, but let's just mine those real quick and try it again. And now we get a TX ID because it works. 10 blocks went by before two weeks went by, or 2016 blocks went by before two weeks went by, so I got the money. 
If, if, if he had won, he would have broadcast this transaction after two weeks goes by, and I wouldn't have been able to because 2016 blocks didn't go by. So that's awesome. We can do uh, we can do gambling on whether the price or on whether hash rate is going to go up or down without needing a third party, just through the power of Bitcoin. Thank you. Woo! All right. Uh, hi everybody. My name is Will. This is Sal. This is John. Um, and today we're going to talk about how we have completely redone from the ground up the uh, Fetty Mint initial setup. Jonah here Woo! is going to talk about the old one and some of the reasons why we wanted to do this. Hey, um, hi everyone. We are ready to check Fetty Mint's that the world. And so the very first thing you see if you want to set up a federation for your community is this, not this one we have currently. But it's quite bad. It's the experience, is. right? <laughs> yeah. The experience is um, our guardian will see this, uh, other guardians will see this as well. Our guardian will say, get started, right? But we have all these forms for them to fill, right? Um, where they have to scroll down and they have to not scroll down, I certainly don't. Okay. So, one thing that's really terrible about this is um, they have to be very, um, they have to much like, for example, consensus configuration, say the federation name. So imagine uh, it's a 10 guardian setup or 11 guardian setup, and someone wrote, you know, like their name and then the federation name, Cypherpunk Federation, and had just space at the end of it or something, maybe misspelled it, maybe case, that federation will fail the setup. We have a lot of other problems around this. Now, what we want to show you today is the new incoming experience in setting up federations. Oh, great, we're going to hand it off to Sahil, who uh, lent his design efforts to this project. All right. Um, so yeah, yeah. As uh, as Joe was saying, there was a lot of issues when it comes to uh, you know different federation uh, guardians putting in information at, at the same time, and you know it doesn't really work properly. So uh, we were thinking through if you can see this, but what this new flow could look like when it comes uh, from, from from a few different perspectives. Right. One is not filling out this massive, scary list of just fields that's like, what the heck is this? Um, and then also solving that issue of, uh, of, of uh, uh, every guardian having to fill out every piece of information. So this sort of proposed model is like this leader follower um, idea where uh, only one guardian has to fill out most of the information. And then uh, the followers, and we're working on this naming, I mean, feel free to give your input, but we're thinking also other other namings like create a federation and join a federation rather than having a leader follower naming structure. But the idea is the this leader would fill out the information and then the followers would join the federation and they would kind of confirm that you want to make sure things are are, are correct there. So let's see. yeah, so you, you get a really good sense of and I think Will's gonna go over this in detail, but you get a good sense of um, where you're at in the steps. And I'll kind of zoom out because I don't want to spoil the uh, spoiled goodies here, but you can see the process where um, kind of like an open open collaborative process in terms of design. Uh, shout out to the Bitcoin design community as well. I mean, this is just the beginning, right? You know, we're going to iterate on this going forward. Um, what else should I touch on? I can see here, there's a bunch of different sub variants. Just, this is just part of the design process, right? Like you want to you want to take all these different sub parts of the flow and try different things, get feedback, see what works. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff there. And, uh, yeah, I think Will's going to show sort of what the final result, or at least it's phase one is. And, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, Figma's are cool. Love the design community, but we all know it's not cool until it's in the browser, or at least, I mean, we're gonna do a hackathon. <laughs> you gotta have some code. So we we're gonna walk through um, what this actually looks like. So over here on the left, uh, this fellow is gonna play leader, and then over here on the right, we're gonna have a follower. So the leader kicks it off, okay, and they've got the, the complicated form. We've stripped down a lot of the unnecessary components in there. So they're going to give themselves a name so that you can kind of see who they are throughout the process. So we'll just call them leader. They're going to pick a password um, that only they know, and that's just for um, kind of carrying on. We're going to make this session recoverable. So if you have three out of four peers and one, one person just doesn't show up, that you can come back later, enter in your password, and just resume your federation setup from where you were. Uh, we're just going to call this federation. Uh, we're only going to do two people today. We're going to go for the standard 10 blocks, uh, and we're going to mean that, baby. I mean, this is, <laughs> oh, oh, good catch, good catch. Uh, 
yeah, but we're living dangerously out here. Okay, great. So uh, we've got this interface um, that we're waiting on our, our peers to uh, check in. Um, and we're gonna pop over here now to our follower and run through that side of the process. So we're going as a follower. As you can see, the form's way simplified for followers. They're just going to be approving or rejecting uh, the config that they get shown. They don't have to fill out the thing, you know, pixel perfect, exactly the same. Uh, so I'm gonna be the follower. I also have a password for if I come back. And we are going to connect to um, the hosts, the, uh, sorry, the leaders, Federation server to grab that configuration information. So we connect, waiting on that, on the config, and there you go. We've got our 10 blocks, we've got the name Federation, and we are in fact running mainnet. So now that I've looked that over, I'm cool with it. I am going to approve that. Now everybody gets uh, these verification codes that they then share out of band. So you hop on Signal, you hop on Telegram, you hop on Discord, you're in the same room, whatever you want to do. You share around your verification codes to everybody. In this case, we only have one set. Um, I happen to know the leader's verification code, just conveniently one, two, three, four, five. Um, and we're going to go ahead and verify that. And then that is going to, oh no, Jeremy Rubin. Oh no, our federation got taken over. It's a covenant now. Oh. Okay, so maybe there's still some bugs to work out. Normally this would take you to the screen where you have all your federation info and now you can start sending it out to everybody who wants to join your federation. But um, this is a work in progress. We got this far, uh, like but we're, right. we're still like working it. on it. Um, this is an open PR against uh, the Fediment repo. We're working openly, transparently, like Sawhill said, we're taking in feedback for this, uh, working along the way. One thing that was surprising to me working on this, um, you may think, you know, okay, so this is a React front end, it's TypeScript, it's like, ah, it's complicated, I don't want all that in the setup. But having these decoupled front ends and back ends leads to better API design. A lot of where we spent time was kind of untangling the API because it, it was built to do things in a very specific way. So by having to rebuild the API from the ground up, we can have resumability, we can have um, you know a better API that more people can come along and build custom interfaces for setting up federations. So if you have you know a simpler federation setup, or maybe you're gonna have a really complex federation with um, you know, crazy contracts and, and stuff going on where you need a lot more in your config. Uh, it's going to be really easy for people to hack on that. Oh yeah, I didn't mention that. The older UI I showed you, it's HTML inside Rust, and we don't have, <laughs> we don't have enough people to contribute to that. With this, you can write your React components, you call an API, uh, we have a contributor, uh, Kitman, as we have a fantastic API. So we are ready to build this experience all out and deploy it. That's, that's it, let's go. Magic. One last thing, we are missing a member up here, Mr. Justin Moon was oh, instrumental yeah. to this, so thank you, Justin, wherever you are. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. But hey, just give us a minute to set up, but while Shop 250 is setting that up, we're Gifster. We are issuing, buying, selling, and redeeming gift cards over Noster using Lightning Payments. And we'll do a quick demo of what we were able to put together. Um, once we have the screen up, basically, we'll have two characters. We'll have Alice, the cake shop, issuing gift cards for cakes, and we'll have Bob, the cake lover, who buys the gift card and then redeems the gift card from Alice's cake shop. Uh, why gift cards? The market for gift cards is going to be, I think, 2.3 trillion people expect by 2030. And also, there are a lot of benefits to just using Lightning to be able to redeem for goods and services from either Bitcoin businesses or potentially return them for cash if needed. Uh, so I think before we go in, let's take a look at what Alice and Bob currently have. So we'll look at Alice's current badges page. And Alice has so far already created a couple of gift cards. We're using a NIP58 badge to issue the gift card and then we're issuing another NIP58 badge to kind of say that's been consumed, you can't use that anymore. Uh, so she's already done that for uh, $21, so she has two badges already. And then if we look at Bob's awarded badges in the badges page, Bob has been awarded thus far the same cake card for $21 and also the redemption card for $21. So what we'll do now is we'll have Alice create a new set of badges with a new denomination of $69, which 
when we run that, Alice will have essentially two badges that she creates. Uh, so she'll have $69 awarded and $69 redeemed. It, it won't yet be awarded to anybody, um, but she'll she'll have them created. So let's run those and let's see if the $69 denominations showed up. So connecting to relays. Oh, don't think mine yeah, but... Yep. Thank you. Yeah, so we're connecting to some relays right now. So relays we're connected to. We're gonna create badge. Okay, now we're publishing the we're signing the, the Nasser events and then we're publishing them to the relays. We have the event ISDs. So now if we go back to the badges page for Alice. We should see two new badges, hopefully. Uh, created. So she has created two new badges for uh, Kate Card and assumed Kate Card. So now, what she's going to do, which we don't have, is she's going to post an advertisement on Noster. Someone's going to, Bob is going to come by and say, I want to buy it. Alice is going to post an invoice. Bob is going to return the pre image of that invoice. And then, after all of that occurs, and Alice can verify that the payment has taken place. Alice will then issue Bob a K card for $69. Right, so now we're, what was this uh, note kind to assign the badge? Uh oh. Okay. So now we should be assigning and publishing the event. So now if we go to Bob's awarded badges page, we should see that Bob, we refresh that, we should see that Bob has an NIP 58 badge for $69. So now some time will pass. Bob will go into uh, the store and Shot 250, who's a clerk at the store, will see that I have the badge. In this case, I don't want to have cake, so I'll request from Shop 250 uh, cash back in exchange. If you could hand me the cash back, of course. And in that exchange, Shop 250 and Alice's Cake Shop is keeping some fees, but I get some cash. And then what will happen is Alice's Cake Shop will go and now issue the redeemed gift card as a badge. So if we run those and we go back to Bob's badges page, we should see that Bob has consumed the $69 gift card. Let's see, I think uh, we need the Bob one. Not sure if it's on there. <laughs> you issued the consume? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know the if Bob. we actually assigned it to Bob. We did. Okay. Consume the K card, $69. I have my cash. Thank you. <laughs> okay, my name is Sean. I made pay me for my API. Uh, it's a package that lets you add a paywall to any API that you've made um, using LM bits. Uh, so lucky for me, I have an API. I made this site a while ago. It's just a US debt tracker. Um, and all the data is available uh, through an API that I'm using for to build this. Um, so I go to API slash data, and I've integrated this package that I built um, onto the website. So now I'm seeing this 402 payment required. Uh, I'm given an API token and an invoice. Um, and then the API token is just added to the browser automatically. So I can take this invoice and I'll pay it. So it's 500 sats for an API refill. Okay, and then if I refresh, it'll detect that I've paid it and now I have access to the API. Um, and it works, so if I just change the API token, delete a character, it'll say it's invalid. Uh, it's really checking that I've paid this invoice. Um, and so I'm using all, or doing all this with LM bits. Uh, so when I went to this for the first time, I generated a new LM bits user.
So I deposited 500 sats, I hit the API endpoint once, so now it's down to 499. And then I also have this admin wallet, so anytime uh, an API request is made, uh, a sat's gonna be sent from the user's account to this admin account. Uh, so if I hit it again, and I refresh, now it's down to 498, and my admin account is up to 139. Um, I'll just show the code pretty quick. I tried to make it as simple to add um, for any API that you have, if it's JavaScript at least. Uh, so you initialize this with some LM bits, environment variables, uh, and you can change how much you want to charge you know, for this bulk deposit, uh, and how much each API cost, or each API request cost. Um, so for mine on that website, I. I made this refill amount 500, and then the request is just one sat, so every API hit, it's just one sat will be taken from your account. Um, and so when you pass this API token, I'm going to check uh, my Lightning node with LM bits, see if they've paid this invoice, and then if they've paid the initial invoice, I'll try to debit their, their wallet. Uh, and if that's successful, then I'll just continue on to the rest of the API, and if not, I'll uh, block it and say payments required, and here's a new invoice to pay. Um, uh, I think that's it. Now, a huge, huge shout out to Austin for his talk. He gave me a lot of the LM bits code. Um, so that was really helpful. Right, thanks. So, uh, one of the things we thought, like, you know, uh, how to get new people to get interested in uh, Bitcoin without getting too much confused. And our solution was why don't we build an AI assistant for Bitcoin? Uh, Bitcoin details. So here comes TTC flow where uh, anything around cryptography, Bitcoin, you can ask and it, the AI assistant gives you the answers in a very properly made uh, format. Right. So, hello everyone. I'm Connor. I'm supporting Jared Repla and I'm very new to the Bitcoin world. So, I just, I just started when I came to this hackathon. And one of the hardest uh, things in uh, the, you know, just in the beginning layer, and one of the hardest things for me is to know the formats of different cryptography tokens. So a Bitcoin address looks very different than, than maybe a transaction ID, but when you look, when you come back and you scan through hundreds of those, it's very hard to forget everything. So I was leveraging uh, GPT-3 to help me identify what type of token uh, is being inputted and explains the concept. So first of all, I'll drag over my extension and open it up. I like Cody's presentation. This is the Replit extension. So you're going to put something in this text box and get a definition on it. So first, I'm just going to go over to mempool and copy this Bitcoin address ID or wallet ID. Forget the definition. Paste it in here and. I run through, it sends a call to an API with GPT-3 and identifies it as a Bitcoin address. So we're cutting it down into different chunks. So this shows the address the version, the hash, and the checksum. So if I were to click on the version, I get an explanation here. I get an address hash, also get the explanation, and also the checksum. I can just go ahead and click view on mempool. So there are hundreds of different tokens. What if you needed a different type? For example, I could, I just, there was this transaction ID, I don't know where it came from or how it came to exist, but I'll try this out, so I'll paste this in. So right now it doesn't know what type of token it is, so it said it's just using GPT to identify it, and it picks it up as a Bitcoin transaction, and not only does it give you a definition here, you're basically given an entire chat GPT right here, which you can talk to about the topic, so I could say, I know there's because I work for Top Feed here, so I could say, um, tell me some more about cryptography. And it, it gives me a definition right there, and I can just continue the conversation. So lastly, what if I were just to dump a bunch of random data into this thing? I'm just going to copy what it looks like. Um, there's some, some stuff on the mempool docs. I'm going to go back. I'm going to paste it in. Fetch this definition. And it identifies it as a Bitcoin block. 
So this Bitcoin uh, block was from this bulk um, API endpoint where you're fetching blocks off of mempool. So once more, I can speak to it through the speak to the chat interface. Although I won't do that. Um, thank you, everyone. So uh, good to see everyone. Thank you very much for uh, going to talk about inscribe linscribe.xyz here for a little bit. So quick, first and foremost, amazing event, everyone. Bitcoin Plus Plus was an amazing weekend. Um, extremely well organized, incredible meeting you all. Um, I would say that this is a culmination of everything I learned over the weekend, but that wouldn't be giving credit to all the amazing education that we actually got in the last couple of days. So really, really good stuff. Um, I wish that this was much more of a premier application for you all at this point. Um, also, I did have to mention, my partner, Trevor, on this little project uh, had to hop on a plane, but Cody, he was very, very excited to meet you and wanted to tell me that um, he said thank you very much for embarrassing him at lunch, uh, causing us to uh, have to come up here and build out a project. So without further ado, what are we actually looking at here? What is Linscribe? Um, so we built out a... Whoops. Okay, that should be okay. Um, we're in the dark here. All good, no worries. Okay, so we built out a Lightning plugin, and the entire idea of it is, you know, this is not an issue that comes across super, super often, but um, if you lose your channel state for your Lightning node, then effectively, what happens after that, right? And like, there's no kind of immutable area to kind of keep this data in. So the purpose of the plugin is that it's going to, um, it currently does, it exports your, your um, your channel state, and then it encrypts it using your private key. Um, and then from there, it'll actually inscribe it onto Ordinal Theory. Right? So that, it, we thought it was a really interesting uh, the, the, the channel data. Um, and unfortunately, my Ord wallet is, uh, we're at like block, like seven, eight, four, something on indexing. So I wasn't actually able to inscribe it onto Ord at the moment. Uh, but ultimately, I believe that the, um, use case is somewhat there. We both have an incredible little landing page for you all to kind of look at it through there. And honestly, that might be it for now. I wish, again, I wish I had a lot more to show with you guys here. Um, I'm gonna continue building this out and get it to uh, some of production and I'll share with you all again. So again, my name is Nick Labra. Thank you guys very much. circuit that's why those things turned off and I'm going to be putting the replit links in the telegram as you guys come up for these so you can uh, look at their code on your computer while they do this. Okay. Did my machine crash no. the whole thing? <laughs> no. <it's not> <laughs> it was subscriptions. <laughs> I've, got, I've, got, I've got Bitcoin, Ord, and Nix running. I mean that this thing was about to like lift off at some point. Ridiculous. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Okay, uh, we are team Anti Ellen Part Dua, and uh, this is a continuation on a project that was started about a month ago at uh, the Satisfy Hackathon. Um, th in this edition, we are extending the functionality of what we built, and uh, the goal, or this is Graph Sync edition. My name is Alex. We're from Atlanta. <laughs> um, yeah, so some background. Uh, yeah, the first couple of slides are just explaining like the, the thing that we already built. But um, yeah, so lightning nodes are run by human beings, and they have a lot to communicate about, uh, like opening channels and uh, managing liquidity. Um, and if your client goes down, uh, there's nothing in the, the protocol uh, to, to say that you're ever going to come back online. So let's say you're updating your node. Uh, there's no way for your channel parties to know, or your channel partners to know, that uh, you, you're not gone for good. So uh, people have to communicate. Typically, people use Twitter and Telegram for communicating with Lightning nodes. Um, but those platforms have some problems with impersonations. Um, yeah, like it's a really scary attack. Like let's say that you're a new Lightning node operator and uh, you want to get liquidity on the network, and you see this big famous node on Telegram, and they reach out to you and say, "Hey, if you send me some Bitcoin, I'm going to open a channel to you." You know, there's, there's problems with that. So, uh, how can we fix that? Well, um, in order to fix that, we need uh, a messaging protocol that's censorship resistant, verifiable signatures, and available when your client goes down. Uh, well, if only there was one of these kinds of protocols. Can anybody think of one of these protocols? Of course you can. It's called Nostra. Uh, censorship resistant, verifiable messaging. Woo! 
<laughs> so uh, Nostra has everything that uh, the, Lightning Node, the Lightning Network paradigm needs, including censorship resistance, verifiable messages with signatures, and uh, the, another like, power feature that the Lightning Network doesn't have is that the, the transport is still online even when your node is offline. So you can use it for clients if one of them goes down. Um, in order to, okay, so now that we have this awesome network, how can we verify that a Lightning Node owns a Nostra account? Um, there is a multi-step process to do that, but step one is creating a, uh, like not, yet yeah, linking the two accounts together. And to do that, uh, there's two kinds of nodes. Basically, there's uh, a profile announcement. This is like a normal uh, profile announcement that you see on Nostra, except that we add a, a pub key in, inside of here. Um, actually, that might be the same pub key. Anyway, this is a normal profile announcement. Uh, and the second node that's a, a new kind of node, uh, this is your attestation. So uh, this kind of node is uh, you take your Lightning Node's uh, pub key and you stick it in here, that's your identity pub key. You sign your end pub, so that's basically the Lightning Node like stamping their approval on the Nostra account. Uh, and then there's also, it got cut off, but there's a, a network in here as well. Uh, so you can say if it's a reg test node or, or an in that node. Um, and when you combine these two things together, you get an experience that's very similar to like a, a blue check mark on Twitter, but it's a verified Lightning Node on Nostra. So once you uh, publish your uh, you, you publish your attestation, you publish your node announcement, you can follow your gossip. You can look for your gossip peers uh, and verify their accounts um, on Nostra. Uh, and then the final step that didn't get written down is uh, you once you verify everybody. Now you have a, a, a verified list of contacts. Um, yeah. So any so any messages that come through that list of contacts, if you see a message, you know that it actually came from. Uh, your, your channel here, or your gossip here. So, what's new with this hackathon? Uh, that, that's all old stuff. Uh, the goal of this hackathon, well, now that we have verified Lightning Nodes, what else can we do? Um, well, we can already talk to each other, but what if we can communicate other kinds of information, like, let's say, graph updates. Uh, like, uh, when, you, when you initially uh, download, or when you initially start up a Lightning Node, you have to sync a lot of information from uh, other nodes on gossip. Well, what if there was a more efficient way to do that? So uh, that's the goal. Uh, and yeah, there's a couple of new, new kinds as well. The first attempt at doing this is a core lighting plugin. Uh, the plan was to use a core lighting plugin and specifically the add gossip RPC, or RPC to uh, inject gossip into the node. So when we see channel updates, we can funnel that into our node. Um, this is a work in progress. Uh, created the uh, the core lightning plugin uh, added a few of the RPCs, but uh, ran into some issues. Um, yeah, feel free to, to poke around uh, the DEFL codes here, but the uh, part two is the stuff that we tested it because he's a way better programmer than me. And uh, yeah, so if you want to talk about Colby? Yeah, so um, we, like Alex said, we started with a core lightning plugin, um, but we ran into a bunch of issues. So what I did was I um, like in Polar, there's, you can spin up an LRD node and a correlating node. So what I did, did was, um, when an LRD node starts up, um, you start up my server, it first um, pulls um, the whole graph from the LRD node, publishes it to an after, and then it also subscribes to new graph updates, and every time there's a new graph update, it also publishes it to an after relay. Um, and then the correlating node, um, using the add cause FRPC, um, takes all those messages and attempts to inject into core lightning, um, which is the little part that I couldn't get to work in because I had to read both specs and uh, it didn't make sense to me. Um, um, anyway, so this is what I built. Um, so this is an awesome relay that's running um, on my local machine. Um, so, um, so um, once it starts up, it connects to the relay, and then this is like the current graph on Polar that has like Alice Bob and Cattle, which is the correlating node, um, and now this is a couple of channels, and um, it prints the whole graph and then attempts to like add all of this uh, to the correlating node. And if you make incremental updates, like if you change the feed rate um, from one of the channels and uh, do this. Um, once Alice updates the feed into Bob, um, the, in Alice broadcasts that um, to the Nostra relay, and those incremental feed updates 
um, are also like published to the relay. And then again, we attempt to insert that the correlating node, but again, that's the part that I couldn't get to work, uh, get it to work uh, because um, apparently I don't understand English while reading NIPs. Uh, sorry, what's it? Bolts. Yeah, uh, <laughs> um, yeah that's, uh, that's about it. That's Gossip Board Master. Oh, and just, uh, yeah, like, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so we we accomplished kind of like the semantics of, of like of, of what we the, the yeah that's fine um yeah like we, we made progress towards it the, the goal is to actually do gossip itself which we didn't do uh, it was just kind of like the the data around that so like we have graph updates but um, I still want to do gossip <laughs> like and actually have gossip over nostril but yeah so that's it thank you hey guys so while Paul gets set up here. Um, I'm Tony, this is Paul, this is Ben. Um, we're from Mutiny Wallet. Uh, and a quick fact, like we kind of, one of our first iterations of the wallet was actually started at BTC Plus Plus last year. So huge props. huge props to setting that up. And we've recently raised um, you know pre-seed to continue off of that idea. So like we, you know, hackathons really matter and you know we're so thankful for all the organizers and everyone trying to do that. So we for this one, you know, we already have like a working wallet, and we're specifically focusing on a new feature that we're going to build into our wallet, and that we've gotten started on today or this weekend. Really. So, this idea that we're building into is called Unity Redshift. It's all, it, you know, if you know about coin swaps at all, it's essentially, you know, Chris Belcher's coin swap idea, having one UTXO and trading it with another UTXO and you kind of like take on the history of someone else's UTXO while discarding um, your old UTXO. So, you know, you know uh, coin swaps aren't ready yet. So one of the things that we wanted to do was use the Lightning Network to accomplish a coin swap. Um, it, what it, you know, the concept of it is you spin up one node, open a channel to someone, um, you spin up another node, have a different node open up a channel to you. Um, then you pass the funds through the Lightning Network, um, you get funds on that new node, you close the channel on that new node, and what you essentially have is you've given your old UTXO to one node, and you've gotten a new UTXO from another. Um, and if you're going through multiple hops, you know, there will not be the source, they won't know the source of funds. Um, from that new UTXO. So, Paul, if you are, you know, Paul or Ben, if you want to talk about that or show off the demo. Yeah, we can give it a shot and see if this works. Uh, so, yeah, we have a mutiny wall here. Uh, we've got 200,000 uh, sats on chain. We've got, we got a couple of receives and their corresponding UTXOs. Uh, so, we'll go into Redshift. And, uh, yeah, you can uh, uh, Redshift into a new UTXO like Tony's talking about being an so instead of closing that inbound channel uh, or that incoming channel, you can just keep it open. Now you, that's just liquidity that you have now on Lightning. And this button actually, the UTXO button doesn't actually work yet. So <laughs> we're gonna do Lightning. And so yeah, let's, uh, so I'm just gonna click uh, UTXO and let's uh, hope it works. It takes a few seconds. This, uh, we got this, this progress, you, you know, nothing's happening in the console log, it's just, I thought it looked great. <laughs> cool. But yeah, a red, we succeeded out of Redshift, uh, so yeah, like Tony said, I mean, we, we always talk, talk about Mutiny as like a node in the browser, Mutiny is also nodes in the browser. So this is a known privacy technique on Lightning that you can gain a lot of privacy for UTXO, but it's kind of a pain in the ass to spin up and manage multiple nodes. Well, we just did that automatically. We created a brand new node and sent funds, uh, some funds to it. And yeah, we can even see this transaction, this, this channel open. Actually, I don't know where this is going to go. There we go. So we have our own custom signal that just has 30 second blocks. So part of the um, speed in it, you know, it did look you know fast. It's just because we're using uh, our, our custom fork of Bitcoin Core with. Uh, 30 second block. So, you know, some of that will look um, longer opening channels to other peers and stuff. That's why that uh, progress bar originally was there. So, so it worked? It worked. It worked. <laughs> Yeah, we got this funds and funds and like we have 100,000 sats left on chain. Uh, we're, we don't have that old UTXO anymore. 
And um, yeah, we sent those on chain and we got them into Lightning and Lake. Those funds are red shifting. Yeah, so just to go over some of the, the problems we had. Um, it's like one thing is like LDK doesn't let you say like, I want to close this channel to this address. So I have a PR to add that. But you know, when who knows when that'll be merged. And we found like a couple small bugs and mutiny along the way. So that was productive as well. And we have to clean up the code a shit ton, but uh, otherwise, almost good to go. And what's actually happening behind the scenes, like multiple nodes, you know, multiple node pub keys are actually being spun up um, in the background and we're abstracting all of that from the user. They just need to know, you know, what funds are on Lightning, what funds are on chain, what UTXOs they have. So, you know, some of the iterations we want to go from here is like actually showing you um, the UTXOs that have been red shifted, the ones that haven't yet, you know, that way you can um, be aware of, of, you know, your own privacy and your own labeling um, of UTXOs. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, so while Topher is getting set up here, I guess I'll give you some overview and some background uh, about what we built. Um, a year ago, I came to Bitcoin Plus Plus. It was my first conference, and I got to do a hackathon with Topher and some other people, and, and I built kind of my full first full stack Lightning app there, and that was really cool. And we got it on mainnet um, for, in time for the hackathon. Um, and one of the things that made that possible was this uh, guy zero fee routing that used to be around that had a really, really easy service for just paying him and getting an inbound channel. So we were able to kind of bootstrap our node and get some inbound liquidity. And so we had the idea, like, wouldn't it be cool if we could, you know, resurrect zero fee routing and kind of be our own zero fee routing. Um, but the only problem is we're plebs, so we don't have very much liquidity. Uh, <laughs> so we can't really be a central provider. So what we decided to do is uh, make this app, and it's at ellininbound.com. And we made it in such a way where you can one-click deploy this uh, from GitHub to Vercel. And all you need to do is put in your Lightning Node info. And then you can be a service provider selling liquidity for whatever price you want, whatever amount you want. And so this kind of cuts out the middleman in these uh, order markets uh, where, where usually for liquidity providers, if it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it happens on some kind of market where maybe someone's taking a fee or something like that. But here, you can just be a pleb, run your one node, you don't need a lot of liquidity, and you can kind of be a liquidity provider for anyone else uh, with a simple UI. So we, we just got our first channel on mainnet working about an hour ago, uh, so we'll see if this works. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I am typing some stuff in the Telegram chat. Uh, I would like some help from the audience. So if you could go to lninbound.com, uh, what you'll see is this screen here. Uh, at step one, uh, you'll see uh, our simple connection string to our node. Just add our node as a peer. Um, it turns out that uh, the friends that we have and between ourselves, like we are all connected and we all have channels now. So now we can't test this. Oh. <laughs> so, but, but if you can connect your node and then just uh, send us your pub key on Telegram, then we can uh, pay the invoice. We'll open a channel to you and we'll do a live demonstration. Man, Ben, you are fast. Yeah. All right, so let's do this. So we have a. Uh, Ben was gracious enough to share us uh, his pub key, so we're gonna check to see if he's connected, and he is. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and open a channel. I'm not sure if this works. Nope, so bug that needs to be fixed, but that's okay. We'll just open the base amount. So uh, does anybody want to pay this invoice? It should be 5,000 sats, but you know, you're trusting my math. Go ahead and pay this invoice. Oh, oh. There it goes. We're opening a channel. It's only five sets. Was it supposed to be only five sets? Uh, again, uh, there's bugs that need to be worked out. <laughs> so uh, liquidity is cheap right now. And uh, let's see, did it go through? All right, I'm gonna do a bold move. We're gonna just hit refresh. We're gonna try this one last time.
Maybe Ben's rejecting us. Maybe. Does anybody else have a pub key we can test? That's yeah. weird with us. Oh, we got paid. We're also trying to build the most connected node in the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, I mean, for what it's worth, it was paid. It was paid? Yeah. Yeah, so it should be trying to open the channel to uh, Ben's node. I didn't get one yet. You didn't get one yet? Okay, let's see what's going on in here. Let's peek behind the curtain. So I'm getting. <laughs> chance size a million sats. Chance size a million sats. Not a pleb. Not a pleb. I'll, I'll turn it off. <laughs> All right, we're going to try Ben one more time. Only once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, also make sure that we can even open a channel to your node. That should be allowed. So where does the person want to go? <laughs> 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 yeah, are you, how are you accepting the payments? Is it like Ellen Bids or what's your background? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's, it's straight from your node. So uh, while uh, Ben is uh, allowing us to graciously open a channel to his node, uh, is, is it ready for us to try again? It's restarting. It's restarting? Okay, let me uh, just go over the, the GitHub real quick. So if you go to our GitHub project as well, we should probably put a link to that. Um, and it's on the website. But yeah, so we designed this in a way where really all you have to do to get started is uh, it could be as simple as just clicking this deploy link. And this will one click deploy uh, this project to Vercel. Uh, you can create it uh, on your own Vercel account for free. And uh, it's going to ask you to put in some basic environment variables, uh, your host name for LND, uh, your LND admin macaroon, some basic fees and stuff. And uh, then that's it. That's all you really need. And then this will kind of sit in front of your node and uh, allow other people to buy channels from you. So let's... It's still restarting. It's still restarting? <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, the connection here is like a little tough to deal with. Oh well, should we just like end it there? Do we have any questions? Should should have done a reg test. <laughs> yeah. We can do a reg test demo real quick, but we gotta keep things rolling. Yeah, we'll keep things rolling, but thank you all for that. That's what we have. We'll keep working on this. Thank you. Uh, it's Ellen Inbound.com. Okay. Um, yeah, so we are team Roy G. Bit. And um, yeah, we built um, a couple of things. We built a Core Lightning plugin, uh, which we're calling Prism. Um, and yeah, you can kind of tell by the, by the little uh, description there. Yeah, it, um, this app. What you're looking at is an interface for it, um, and it creates lightning prisms, which are special type of bolt 12 offers. Uh, so under the hood, um, our UI makes a call to uh, to a core lightning node, creates a bolt 12, and then the plugin itself is uh, listening to these specific special bolt 12s uh, and uh, receives those payments, and then has a set of percentage uh, breakdown of who these payments should be split up and then sent to. So we'll do a little demo here. So this is uh, how to connect to your node. Um, yeah, you can, if you look through the, uh, the previous talks at the conference, um, Aaron put together a little starter, like boilerplate for how to create like a core lightning app, uh, web app. So we can't afford that. And this is, this is a lot of this functionality is already there. So if anybody wants to do this kind of uh, connection uh, process. You can you can fork that repo. Uh, so you put in your address. You put in a room. Um, we're going to give this prism a name. 
don't know, call it my prism. Um, and we just defaulted to two members in the prism. Um, obviously, it would be nice if the UI offered the ability to offer, you know, add as many members as you want. So Aaron's going to go ahead and add all the details. We need a name uh, for each for each member in the prism. Um, we need the pub key. For now, we're just we just support pub keys, but obviously we we would uh, extend that. Um, and what's the last thing you need there? Yeah, their share. So in this example, yeah, Aaron gets a uh, two and uh, Frank gets one. So you can see the percentage. Um, this information, these, these three fields are sent to the node and this is stored by the plugin. So there you go, we have our uh, bolt 12 and yeah, Aaron's going to attempt for Bob uh, to complete this, uh, complete this payment to Frank. And then Frank, under the hood, is going to uh, split this payment and send it on to the other the members of the prism. Um, we'll, we'll give this a go. We had some issues with the, the Polar UI. It's not uh, not being reactive to the payments, but we're we're going to do it in the command line style here. So Arns, we'll fetch the invoice for the for the bulk twelve, and then we will pay it, and that pays the bulk twelve and the plugin uh, goes ahead and will fan those transactions out to the, to the two nodes here. Um, but Polar, for some reason, doesn't seem to show key sends in the balance updates, uh, but we can verify uh, by checking in the CLI uh, that an invoice was paid. Uh, by listing the invoices, and you can see a key send payment in there uh, that's been fanned out based on that 200 uh, MSATs, it was split 60% uh, to this node and 30% to the other one. Cool. Yeah. So that's uh, that's the demo part, and then uh, yeah, Dee's going to do a quick just uh, run through the kind of issues that we faced and kind of where this where this project could go. Um, Sure, so uh, we weren't allowed to make a slide deck today. However, we snuck a presentation into our GitHub readme. <laughs> so um, as you can see, we have uh, some to-do list items here. Uh, the HTML5 canvas is going to be even more responsive in version 2.0. Currently, the Prisms are not editable, meaning they cannot be changed. Of course, that is also coming soon TM. You'll be able to change the outputs as well as their percentage shares. We're going to be adding support for outputting Prisms to other Bolt 12 offers, LN URL keys, static QR codes, lightning addresses, and maybe we'll even throw AMP in there, why not? Uh, currently, as stated before, we only support key send payments in this preliminary iteration. We're also going to be adding different payout strategies such as thresholds. If you're doing some kind of value for value podcast, you might not want to split a payment for a couple of Satoshis, so you can set a threshold that will be met when your band members, let's say, get their payouts, as well as payment schedules. Um, as stated before, some of the challenges that we did face were problems with Polar. We kind of uh, ditched Polar and used Docker sort of on its own, and then we, we <laughs> resurrected Polar, as you saw. Um, we also had some challenges with our local dev environment uh, with Core Lightning. Uh, but that said, our demo did work, and I'm really proud of the team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just wanted to add a little bit of context for like how this could be used to hint today, like value for value podcasts. Um, but the idea is you have a project that has multiple contributors to it, and the plugin will just create this one Bolt 12 offer, and then that can be paid. And then depending on the people's different contributions, the splits can be defined, and then that Bolt 12 offer gets paid, and then in the back end it gets split out to everyone that was involved in the project. Um, I guess I'll just mention one last thing. There's kind of a second part, the Docker uh, repo. We were trying to do Polar Lightning, as mentioned, but we kind of had to move over to just Docker Compose and a uh, script that does all of the channel openings on a test network of four nodes. Hey everyone, 
so this is a bit more of a contribution than a pack. Um, but a few of us wanted to um, contribute to this project called Mixed Bitcoin. So if you end up running with uh, problems with Docker, thanks last group for the introduction. Uh, we uh, we want to add a C Lightning plugin to um, to Mixed Bitcoin. So that's what we did. Uh, let me actually pull this up if I can. There you go. All right, so yeah, we added a uh, package in Nix Bitcoin. Uh, Pepsi up in Nix. It's the circular rebalancing uh, C Lightning plugin. Uh, kind of a work in progress, uh, almost there. Kind of falls on its face when we load it, but at least we got a work in progress PR there. Um, the if you want to contribute to this project uh, and see how dope Nix Bitcoin is for working with it, you can just jump into Nix Bitcoin examples on this branch and run your own. Kimu VM that Nix Bitcoin provides, and it will load you a whole Nix Bitcoin node declared and configured, and with everything you need in it, including the circular CM plugin, um, and test it yourself. In this case, it will launch us a full Bitcoin node with a Lightning, everything you need in it, and the circular plugin, which currently falls over. That's it. Uh. Okay, so my project is PSDT++. The idea was to have a workbench type GUI application that runs in the desktop that's also cross-platform that um, uh, allows you to check uh, PSVTs. So this was really just me scratching my own itch. Um, and uh, so what I have now here, um, Oh, well, this is interesting because the resolution now makes it so you can't see it, but essentially you just check one and you check two, and uh, it allows you to see all the uh, fields of the PSVT and lets you quickly inspect um, you know, everything that's going on. Uh, ideally, this would have uh, pretty printing, but uh, it was a really nice day out today, so I uh, decided to go outside. <laughs> um, my, uh, my intention is to add um, uh, you know, pretty much anything that a, a Bitcoin developer would want uh, very quickly. Like, for example, sometimes you just want an address for your experiment, um, or you just want to debug uh, some mini script uh, uh, very easily. So, um, basically, yeah, this is uh, all I have. And uh, oh, yeah, and so, like, if you change something, oh, whoops, I made a crash. <laughs> um, if you change something, it just won't. Uh, show that they're matching. So here you can see that if you check it, it doesn't actually work. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's all I have. So thank you. All right, hey, what's up guys? Uh, so we made a thing called Pay to Lightning Channel or P2, P P2LC. Um, this is for the future of Bitcoin when you want to do an on-chain payment directly into a um, into a Lightning channel. Um, we used the V2 channel opening protocol, which Dusty is an, an expert on, um, and uh, <laughs> uh, taught me a lot. And um, we uh, and we made a demo that's kind of halfway to a finished product, where you just put in a PSBT into this text box. Um, which this is actually a, a, an interface that Dusty made. Yeah, I, we worked really hard on the, uh, the CSS for the button. So <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, we wanted to make sure you could really, really see it. Um, so yeah, so um, so what you do is you take a PSVT and you put it in, and then what's going to happen in the background is um, it's going to um, it's going to create a Lightning channel from that PSVT. Right, and so like. A lot of people today, they receive funds on Lightning, and then they have to pay to open their own channels, and that's lame. Who wants to do that, right? Why not get the guy that's paying you to open your channel for you? Yeah. It makes sense, right? I think once this idea catches on, nobody's using on-chain directly anymore at all. Every, yeah. Everything will be a pay to LC. Yeah, exactly. So this is an interface that Dusty made that connects to the RegTest um, Core Lightning network that he has running. Um, and on his machine, and so it's going to live update and show us what's happening yeah, with, and, the, with the reg test. And uh, to be yeah. clear, uh, this is definitely not going to bug out, right? So at all. Yeah. yeah there's, there's no, no chance, chance of that. Whatever. This is rock solid prod ready code right here. <laughs> all right, we have our, we have a pre-made PSPT. Uh, it's actually very huge, and the problem is it's got a previous transaction embedded in it. And I would love to use the last tool to modify that PSPT to remove that. So if we had that feature, I would love that. Anyway, huge PSPT is going to go in. 
and we're gonna hit the button. And hopefully it's gonna work. It does take a while though, so we're gonna kind of wait. But well, we can monitor it on the command line to see if it's actually going. Oh, we didn't turn it on. <laughs> okay, it's on. All right, all right. Now we're gonna hit the button again. This time it's actually connected. It's gonna take a while, but it's doing things. Okay. I have the command line. That's, that's scary looking. Look at the three things. Yeah, that yeah. 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 it, it actually takes takes quite a while. Great job. Yeah, I think I think it takes a while to demonstrate how hard you work on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's how those things work. Yeah, that. that this, added, yeah. What? Yes. Is this a React framework? Or using Next.js? What, what oh, I just I just uh, you know um, <laughs> it's a hackathon. <laughs> I may have used a hack. It's called hack.js. <laughs> and I may have just, you know, broken the web sockets on Core Lightning and connected them to JavaScript and just, you know, channeled things through that don't have permission to be where they are. But anyway, it works. It well, hopefully works. Is it going? I think it went. I think it went. Oh, we got... Oh! Yeah. Someone paid us and immediately went into these three channels. We got three channels for free, not just one. Uh, and that's... Uh, no, any more thoughts? Um, yeah, three channels is better than one. And I want, so, so, so there is actually a, a real um, single lightning transaction that all, that that PSPT went into creating. So all three of these channels are based on one opening yep. transaction. One transaction was harmed in the making of this channel. Only one. Yeah. And that's it. Woo. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is like way too much personal crap, guys. Just shield your eyes. All right, so. Um, my project's called uh, BitPonzi. It's supposed to be a little playful because um, I don't really have a project, but I do want to uh, kind of say what I learned because I did learn a bunch of stuff and I kind of want to share that with you and then also say what I worked on. Maybe it's eligible for a reward if you have a big heart. Uh, <laughs> but one thing that was kind of cool that I learned is all about sediment and how it would look to implement some of the new ideas with gateways uh, that uh, OK Jodom uh, and Justin's working on. And it's, I work at Zebedee, so it's like, okay, how would Zebedee potentially be a gateway for Fediment, right? And what, and like, what, what is Fediment? Because I, I also need, I, I kind of have like an idea what Fediment is. It's just like this thing, and you can do stuff, and it's like, okay, I didn't know much more after that, but I did learn quite a bit. But if we do abstract Fediment to just be like this sort of like black box federation of things that, uh, a place where you can do things, and, and when I say do things, it's very like abstract, where you can do just about anything that, that can be implemented, right? It's, it's, I feel like Fediment is the right abstractions at the right levels, and it, and it, trade, it has the, uh, a good like trade-off of responsibilities with its architecture, so I, I do, I do kind of like that. Um, so this idea with gateways is people can like plug in as like a super user, or like as a, as like a power user, and they can plug into Fediment and then also provide like third-party vendor services that the Fediment then can use. And the cool part that we kind of like experimented with was, okay, what does it look like, you know, for these gateways long term, like, you know, what does it look like to facilitate, you know, lightning transactions? And, and we, we actually spec'd it out. We, we actually spec'd something out that we plan on building, like live in production. Uh, I want I want this to happen with Zebedee and, and uh, one of the Fediment clusters. The, for this example, uh, the Fediment cluster is called FedEx, um, and and we, we kind of this is it's not necessarily important like with the network calls between the different actors, but the idea is um, we'll 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 come up with a model that's reusable for other providers that want to also be gateway pro providers for various Fediment nodes. So if I say, hey, look. I can uh, I can be a vendor to facilitate all your lightning payments. It's like, well, how do you do that in trustless way? Well, well we, we, we scope that out. So Fediment uh, can actually in, uh, interface with an API of a gateway, not use lightning at all, but then have uh, pre-images and proofs to prove that payments were made and secrets were revealed and make sure e-cash is delivered on the Fediment side and money's delivered on the gateway side. So it's kind of cool. Uh, it's it's uh, kind of a crossbreed between native lightning transactions and um, Fediment stuff, and then also just generic web hooks and API calls. So it's I thought I thought it was real neat. Um, sending ended up being like really easy um, for our use case, but we would actually need to soft fork Zebedee's API um, to, <laughs> to implement receives, uh, where we uh, have like a pre-image uh, endpoint, which I think would be really neat. And if we do this, it's like okay, if Fediment really take off, it's like hey, there might be a bunch of money into providing the service for multiple Fediments as a you know, as a gateway. So I thought that was kind of cool. So that's I. Although this doesn't look 
like a whole lot. It took quite a bit of time to kind of finalize this kind of design. Um, so uh, September, make sure you you hold my ass to it, like put a fire under me, like make sure like this is implemented by Tapcom because I, I wanted like to maybe show this off kind of stuff by then. Um, let me take a quick look at my notes. Uh, okay. All right. So um, I know I know my project's called. Uh, oh, look at that. All right. So let me distract you while I download a thirty megabyte WASM file right now because I don't know how to build proper WASM files. Uh, does anyone have a like a Bitcoin joke or anything? This is oh let, uh, actually let me tell you about Wasm a little bit. So so uh, Mutiny obviously has been working on Wasm. If you don't know what Wasm is, it's like WebAssembly stuff. It's it's the future of web, right? Who needs TypeScript and JavaScript in the future, right? Yeah. Um, but one thing that is needed is your Wasm is kind of like this blob that does all kinds of stuff. But in order for your Wasm uh, Wasm is like sandbox and it can't do I/O, right? So how do you actually do anything useful, right? So what ends up happening is you need all these Java hooks that go in, like almost like as a middleware that go into your Wasm binary. Your Wasm does stuff, responds to the Java hooks, and then responds back and does I/O. So um, it's kind of interesting if you're if you're interested in WebAssembly. It's I, I still feel like it's you're playing on hard mode, but it it is very cool, especially if you're doing something complicated within the Wasm uh, you know blob. Okay, it's loaded. We can stop talking about that. <laughs> okay. So who's like funny? Like I, I just feel like the funniest person in Bitcoin right now is Super Testnet. So we'll just use him. Thanks. I have a joke for you. Okay, all right. And then uh, I want to demonstrate this really cool idea. Uh, can anyone please pay this invoice? This is part, I actually am going to just stand up here until someone pays it. Someone can just pay this invoice and it demonstrates actually this really cool smart contract that I want to show off. Um, proof of Pete. Proof of And notice it's like maroon. Oh. Oh. Expired. Try again. <laughs> I expire them every one minute. I, I have very low tolerance for people who take too long. Okay, we're at okay. So so something that's really interesting that happens. So we're at a hundred. Oh, look at that. We got the block height. We paid off hundred sats. We got the block height. But what happens if we pay this QR code one more time? Can I get someone to pay this QR? Let's go. Can I get one more payment to this QR code? Let's see. Let's what we got. What we got? What we got? Bam! 150. Come on! Can I get a 200? Let's go, man! And that is proof. Of, that is a uh, bit Ponzi. Thank you. Um. So I took Dustin's lovely core lightning interface that shows you what's going on with the lightning nodes, and I refactored it. <laughs> uh, so in <laughs> instead of one long like, HTML file, we have an HTML file which is actually really understandable. Um, <laughs> that's the whole thing. Um, and then there's a CSS file which is uh, a little less than 240 lines long. There are no dependencies. There's no like. We didn't import a bunch of JavaScript libraries or anything to make it pretty. We just use CSS and make it bigger. Um, and it has a full screen feature, which makes it look like that. But uh, it scales. <laughs> <laughs> and we also took. So there's some hidden interfaces in Dusty's thing. So we've got uh, the on chain transactions. Um, and now we can see them on a block. Chain. Uh, and then we also have the uh, this console thing, which now looks way cooler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah any questions? <laughs> nice job. Yeah. CSS, I've never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs>
It's yeah. called Cascading yeah. Style Sheets. It was invented <laughs> in the mid-90s by Bert Boss and Malcolm Lindley. And, <laughs> and it's now maintained by the CSS Working Group at the Patriot Seat. I thought it was a computer science scam. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I recommend learning HTML. This is like this interactivity is built into the details element, it's, and there's like a lot of cool stuff you can do with HTML. Mm -hmm. And the layout's done with grid and flex block. Go flex block. Hey, block. What's up, Cody? Yeah. Uh, well, thanks everyone for sticking through it. It's a lot of presentations, a lot of awesome stuff. Um, so what I'm going to be sharing is, so my day job, I work on uh, multi-sig, but uh, at night I'm reckless and I play around with lightning authentication. So this is something that, um, so this is a project that's basically using uh, this type of authentication, using macaroons for Nostra authentication. So uh, for some background, what are LSATs? Currently, it's a protocol name that's under legal scrutiny, so that's one thing. Um, but it stands for Lightning Service Authentication Tokens. I won't go the whole spiel, but the basic idea is building out. There's always been this HTTP um, uh, number response code, status code 402, like since the beginning of HTTP, to uh, basically have payments required to reach certain endpoints but we didn't have a native uh, money to the internet to really implement something like that. So the idea with, with um, 402s, uh, formerly known as LSATs, is to basically connect access with Lightning proof of payments. So they are stateful, portable, authenticate, they have authentication and authorization, they require payment without additional server infrastructure, so you just can do it just with your Lightning node and kind of like check on the, check if something has been paid or not, and the rest of the authentication is embedded in the macaroon itself. Okay, so uh, why use this in Nostr? That is a good question, because there is uh, a, uh, a NIP already for that, NIP 42, but um, I thought that there's a way that we could build on top of that, so right now, Nostra authentication is ephemeral, it's tied to a single node, and it's not really explicitly tied to a payment. So, you know, you implement that logic and you might want, you might not. Uh, so, as part of this, I created a NIP proposal, so NIP 402, and the idea is essentially that, let me see if I can, let me show, oh, I had the images, yeah. Um, so, the idea is similar to NIP 42, where the um, you might try and do something that needs some payments, and then the relay would send back a off response um, in the in the WebSocket, and in that would be embedded an LSAT um, challenge string. So currently in, in NIP 42, it's just a normal challenge, and you sign it and you come back with that signature, and you're done. Uh, and then, but in this. Rather than having an ephemeral um, uh, message, it would it would stick, and you would send back an LSAT, which also has the invoice information in it that you have to pay. So basically, it says here, in order to do this, you have to get the you have to pay this invoice, and then you have permissions to do these things, and um, and then yeah, and then you can you'll have access. So what does that look like? Let me see. Um, yeah, let's quickly show what that looks like. Um, Unfortunately, so one of the challenges I found with this is for this project that there's there's basically three repos. There's the NIP. There's the um, uh, I built a, basically a very pared down client, uh, basically a Nostr, an LSAT enabled Nostr client using LSAT.js, and then I had to hack in support for a non-existent uh, NIP into uh, a Relay implementation. And I did that for Nostream. Um, so and so. I have a fork of Nostream that is also LSAT capable. Uh, the problem is it's not really managing the invoices as I expected it to, so I can't check the status of the invoice as easily as I would have liked. But so it's not fully working on the back end. But you can see here, so I have this client, so there's some tests that went through uh, to this relay, and I'm gonna try and say um, can I do this? Uh, no, you can't. 
and I would have to pay this invoice. And um, and you can see actually here, this is coming through on the relay as well. There's the invoice. Uh, there's also an LSAT uh, up here. This is basically what the LSAT looks like. Uh, and then I don't have a database in the client right now, it's just terminal, but it saves in a text file. And I'll just show what that looks like because you can kind of you can kind of get the power of this when you see what's on the LSAT. So this is a playground for basically parsing, interacting with the LSATs. And one of the things that's really cool and that's in the NIP uh, as well is this idea of so caveat. So when you create a, a, an LSAT, you're not just saying uh, if you pay this. You, you can have access. You can you can have these caveats to say if you pay this or if you show me this this macaroon, you can do these things. You have permission to do these things. So that's embedded in this caveat that says kind one nine eleven. But what I think is really powerful about this protocol is I could actually I paid for this access to this relay. I can add a more restrictive caveat that says actually anybody that has this caveat can only do um, Nostr events one and nine. And then you would give that that LSAT out to somebody else, and you could actually do this with, I, I'm pretty sure I wasn't able to test this out, but with NIP 26 delegation. So you basically say, all right, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna share ownership over this particular LSAT, but all that person would have is this, this slightly like more restrictive one. Um, so, yeah, that's what else what can you do with this? Why use this for Nostr? Um, as I explained, you could delegate access. Another thing that I think is pretty cool is you could sell your authorization over Nostr. So, um, you know, one idea what you could have would be there would be a second NIP uh, that uh, I haven't written up, but it would be that you can basically transfer ownership. And this is where Nostr, I think, really shines because. Um, if other people wanted to be aware of this authorization that you purchased, uh, you could actually relay the message like, okay, the owner of this LSAT, which has a proof of payment on it, is not, has not been transferred elsewhere. And um, then you could do stuff like you're using LSAT for, for ticket access, for access to certain endpoints, and maybe they're managed by, by many relays, and you can actually transfer ownership, which was one of the original ideas when LSATs were first uh, announced in like 2019. And I think Nostra actually makes this more possible without having a centralized marketplace. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess I can only put one repo, one link in the in the replit. So there are there are these three branches and PRs um, that I have. So I think it's all the presentation. Did we miss anyone? Great. Let's get a round of applause again for all the hard work. Okay, so I'm going to take the judges. We're going to head to room five over here, have a quick powwow, and hopefully we're just going to be like 10 minutes of talking, maybe 15. So let's meet back here in um, maybe 5.45, or probably closer to 5.50 for being honest. All right, cool. Thanks, I'll see you soon. First of all, I want to say a big thank you to our judges. Some of them um, came here on their Sunday, just flying in for maybe um, foreign countries, etc. So a big round of applause to um, Yeah, so thank you to Tur, Dulce, and Mike for coming up and showing up on a Sunday to help us figure out uh, who had the best hats. Um, great, okay, cool. Um, so starting off, so we, we decided we were going to add a third place, um, and, and we're going to give the third place a Base 58 class because there were just so many amazing projects. We had a really hard time judging, so thank you for everyone for making this a really difficult hackathon. Um, I think the competition here is higher than most hackathons that I've seen. So, um, yeah, thanks everyone. First of all, I'm going to give off our, uh, our FETI bonus to um, the FETIMIT Guardian Setup UI. <laughs> See me after while I hand out stuff. Um, cool. Uh, so third, um, maybe we do like a.
after we're gonna figure that out. If there's like seven of you, yeah. all right, cool. Uh, great. Oh, again, yeah, awesome job, everyone. Thank you. We do commercial for the next Bitcoin Plus Plus. Um, yes. These are the what? Yes. These are uh, these are tentative plans, but you know I'm just gonna float it out there so you can make some circles on calendars. Yes, he's actually doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna um, yeah, so uh, there's some tentative plans for Bitcoin Plus Plus in Paris. It's gonna be Nick's focus. We're gonna try and get as many of the people from the next Bitcoin community to come out and hang out for two days on Friday and Saturday somewhere in Paris, I don't know. Um, uh, we're trying to see if you're going to do one in Latin America, maybe in January 2024, so keep your travel plans open. And of course, there will be another Bitcoin Plus Plus next year in Austin, Texas, the same week as consensus, so as soon as we figure out when that is. part of and I can't wait to see you guys all maybe here or somewhere else next year. Yeah. Woo! Woo!